in Colossians. We are continuing our study, <clears throat> series of messages out of the book of Colossians. We are in chapter 2, beginning of chapter 2. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, there are actually two divisions within those first eight verses. The first part of chapter 2 deals with the identity of who Christ is as His authority and power. I'm going to read it, but I actually want to deal with the second division of chapter 2 found in verses 4 through 7, or excuse me, 4 through 8. So let's do, let's t deal with the first, uh, three verses. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at, at uh, them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my f face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love and unto all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of the Christ. Verse 3 is the key. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Colossians and he's speaking to this church. And what he's identifying here that all wisdom and knowledge is in God. In the Lord, in Jesus Christ, in the Trinity, the fullness of God. He makes that acknowledgement, and then he actually begins what I think is the heart of this message. And what I want to try to do tonight is simply share with you <clears throat> what I think the basic foundation of the church ought to be. And we've already identified that it's Jesus. It's Jesus. And I don't know that we can say that enough. I don't know that we can convince ourselves of the authority that God has and that the church must be established. But he goes on and he begins with a warning. And by the way, as I begin to read that warning, folks, there's some guys and Preachers out there that are preaching some stuff that's just pure bunk, in my opinion. And we need to be careful of what we listen to and stay with the authority of God's Word. Amen? So this begins a warning, and he says in verse 4, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you, fool you, with enticing words. <clears throat> For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order. First off, first point. I'm glad that we have a liberty here at this church. But I thank God that, Brother Bobby, there is even an order in our liberty. <coughs> that we're open to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, we maintain doctrinal integrity to the Word of God. That we stay with the truth of God's Word. Now, you don't have to go very far to find people that would come into our worship service and go, Lord, have mercy. What are y'all doing? Because they've been up, raised up in a tradition of be quiet, don't move, don't lift your hand, don't say amen. Uh, the music's got to be a certain way and... They would call that order. I call that tradition. In many cases, I call it dead worship. But I am saying this. Even in liberty, there needs to be order. Now he moves on to his second point. Beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith 
in Christ. My brother called me the other night. Hal did, my baby brother. and We were talking about <clears throat> situations in his life and people that he's being exposed to and dealing with. And he said, he said, Joe, he said, do you know the people that I have the greatest respect for in church? And I said, uh, who? He says, it's those men and women that get up and come to church every Sunday. They're not jumping and shouting and flashy. They're not all up and public about their business. But they're faithful consistent and steadfast in the Word of God and in the worship of God. Look, I don't care how loud you shout and jump. And I don't care about those things. I'm wanting to know, can you live it? Can you walk it? A lot of people can talk it, but they can't walk it. And so the Apostle Paul was writing a, an accommodation and a warning also. That he was saying, I, I, I'm excited, I joy in the fact that you have order there in the church at Colossae, but, but above that, I'm thrilled to death that you're a consistent, solid, biblically based group. I think that ought to be the order of the day for the church, amen? Then he moves on from that point. In verse 6 he says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. This is the comment that Hal made. Hal said, you know, Joe, the Christian life is not a foot race. It's a marathon. It's all about walking it. Day by day, Terry, getting up, doing what God says do, being faithful, being in order, being consistent, just living it out and doing it day by day by day. If all you have of walk with God is what you do on Sunday, you don't have a walk with God that will sustain. Now let's move on from that. He identifies the walk with God in verse 6. And then he establishes what a walk should look like. He says in verse 7 that it ought to be rooted. He said, well, I thought about this verse tonight in view of the Scripture that we had in our prayer meeting this morning. If you're going to be in the true vine and produce fruit, you got to have a good root. You've got to have your root sunk and established in the Word of God. If, you're, if your root is so shallow that when dry times come, you die, or when windy times come, and they do, you get blown away. If you've got a root, that doesn't have an established feeder system, you can't draw the nutrients and the strength and the sustenance that it takes to bear fruit in your life. Do you remember what Jesus did with the fig tree that had no fruit? He cursed it. Not because it didn't have leaf, because it bore no fruit. To have a walk with God... We must be rooted, built up in Him, and established in faith. I, I underline three words in this passage in verse 7. I underline the word rooted. Second of all, I underline the word built. That is to, indicates to me that it is not an event, but is an ongoing process. It's like building a house. 
I mean, you got to start with a foundation, and then you got to put the basic structure together. Then you got to black it in, and then you got to put the shingles on the roof, and then you get everything finished on the outside. Then you got to go to work on the inside. Wall it up, electricity. I mean, it's just an ongoing process. Well, the Christian faith and the Christian life is just like that. If we're not building on it, we don't have anything. Robert, it's a matter of adding to. <coughs> it says to be built up in the faith, to be established in the faith, to, to, to work on our Christian life, not just to think that it's going to exist because I love the Lord. It takes work. A daily commitment, a daily building, a daily additions to whatever it is that God would have us to do. Abounding therein with thanksgiving. Verse 8, and I'll close. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Folks, the church is not about the world. It's about Jesus. It's not about the doctrines of the Baptist faith. I'm a Baptist. But it's not about the doctrines of the Baptist faith. It's about our daily walk with Jesus Christ. It's about maintaining the Word of God in our own hearts and in our own lives. Amen? If you rejoice in that, let's stand to our feet.